Welcome back, everyone, to Open Line. Glad you are with us. We are talking history, specifically civil rights history, highlighting overshadowed civil rights stories. We have with us Elliot Robinson. He's a program specialist with the Nashville Public Library, and also Mark Izell, commissioner with the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development. And all right, we kind of set the table in the first segment. I want to ask, I want to ask you, Elliot, about um, Reverend Lawson. And, and so you, you have this room in the library where you celebrate these stories, remember these stories. Please, if you don't mind, talk about his role in the civil rights movement here in Nashville. Well, Reverend James Lawson uh, was a minister. He was ordained as a minister before he even finished high school in Ohio. And, uh, and he spent a stint in, in jail after, being, after you know, refusing to be drafted into military service. And after he got out of jail, he, he spent some time in India studying the principles of civil disobedience and nonviolent protest under disciples of Mahatma Gandhi. And when he came back to the States, he was in uh, graduate school at Oberlin College in Ohio. And he had a chance to meet Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And Dr. King found out that he had studied these things and, and studied these principles. And he says to Reverend Lawson, uh, you, we need you down south somewhere. We don't have anyone like you down south. And Reverend Lawson considered Atlanta and, Van and uh, Nashville, and he chose to come here because he wanted to enroll at Vanderbilt Divinity School. And this was 1958. And then in 1959 is when he began to prepare these students from the local black colleges and then some of the white allies. He began to train these students in these ways of nonviolence in 1959. And they chose the lunch counters because so many people were familiar with the indignities of what it was like to shop downtown. Uh, as a black man, I would be allowed to buy merchandise, of course. Uh, I probably would not be allowed to try on any clothes. Uh, probably would, in many places, be denied use of the restroom facilities. And then, in being in the same stores where I'm spending my money, these wonderful lunch counters with the glass domes and the cakes and pies underneath and the soda jerk and the paper hat, you know, making banana splits or whatever, I would not be allowed to be served at the counter because that, that's the way it was. And Reverend Lawson began to train these students, and they chose the lunch counter as, as the initial focus of this movement. And that's interesting to me about how organized it was. So uh, Dr. King knew Reverend Lawson and said, we need you. And, and, and Reverend Lawson had studied under Mahatma Gandhi. Under disciples of Mahatma Gandhi, yes. Wow. And, and said, we need you in the South. And he chose Nashville. Yes. And um, so was he kind of reporting in constant contact with, with Martin Luther King? Or how was that going? Well, he had, his, he had his own thing going on here, and uh, Diane Nash has a famous quote. She says, I came to Fisk University, and she knew segregation. She knew what segregation was. From, she was from Chicago, but she hadn't been in such a place where it was so overt, you know, with the signs and everything. And she joined the workshops with Reverend Lawson because she said it was the only game in town. It was the only group that was trying to actually actively do something to combat uh, mm -hmm. segregation. And um, let me ask a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. and yeah. oh, are, how many students were involved? So Reverend Lawson is training students, talking to students. Is it 100? Is it 50? Is it, you know, 12 really great ones? What, how, what, what are we talking about? It, it grew greatly. Uh, there were test missions in late 1959 where a couple of folks would go out to the counters and when they were asked to leave, they would leave. But they would take back as much information as they could to the workshops. How many stools are there inside the place? What kind of access is there going in and out? So that they could formulate a specific plan for each store. And when they rolled out on February 13th, 1960, the very first day of the sit-ins, a Saturday afternoon, about high noon, uh, there were about 125 students in the, in the group the first day. And it grew very quickly. Within two weeks, by February 27th, two Saturdays from then, there, there were over 600. 600? So it, it grew very rapidly, yes. And what stands out to you when, when you look back at that? The planning, the preparation, the recruitment, the organization, uh, and, and, and the dedication to the principles and being able to remain nonviolent. You were discouraged from going to participate at the lunch counters if, if leadership wasn't reasonably sure that you could follow all of the rules, all ten of those rules. So they didn't want anyone down there to be going off script or uh, then jeopardizing the mission. Because one person could mess the whole thing up. Oh, yes. Wow. And how, how is that highlighted in the, in the podcast and that kind of thing? The stuff you're hearing is fascinating stuff. What, what about that? Well, I mean, again, when you hear of the treatment that the students endured, 
and then when they left and went outside and then they were arrested all of them not the people who had been violent not the whites who had done the law breaking um, and I, 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 when, when you sit with the story in the podcast um, the injustice you just wait a minute I'm you're 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 penalizing the wrong group mm. um, and, and that's wrong and why would we do that um, I can't my sense as a person of faith I I cannot reconcile those two actions and and it especially when you understand that this group was well trained to be peaceful <laughs> and to to tolerate and to to allow people to treat them badly uh, reminds me of someone that I follow in faith you know mm. that that again um, uh, so that was one of the reactions that I had in listening to the podcast. I've listened to it actually a couple of times, and I get about as emotional the second time because you're, people go and spend time in jail to avoid paying the $50 fine, these students mm -hmm. who had done nothing wrong, and the, the, the people, it's hard not to use words to describe the people who were harmful to them, got to laugh and, as, they're, as they're carried away. So, Elliot, what, what, what else would that, that, and again, I'm learning through that podcast about yeah. that, but it's emotional for me. It is emotional. And, and, and I think for all of us. And it's good that it's, it is getting out there. And, and it's good that this is being celebrated as part of, um, I guess, you know, tourism. It's something that, that there is a demand to better understand. And here is some accurate information getting it out there, and people are learning. And it's nothing but positive comes from it. And it's very powerful. Um, and it's great that the Department of Tourism is doing this. Well, and, and I would say, you know, that for tourism, our job is to inspire and motivate people to come to Tennessee and to spend money here. Um, and from my business background, I didn't have a tourism background. I had a business background. And what I was, when I got in and started seeing the dollars that the second leading industry in the state of Tennessee of tourism, travel, leisure, and hospitality, what it generates in sales tax dollars for local and state governments, stunning. Last, last year, the leisure and hospitality, you, you want to know how much money they brought in sales tax for the state? $1.5 billion. Wow. wow. What that allows then the legislature, the administration to do, uh, the tourism budget's in the tens of millions of dollars. So what it allows is for services, education being the biggest, but education and health care and, and all kinds of protections, uh, roads, other things that are created with that money that comes from a visitor dollar. Yeah. And then they leave and go home. And so you don't have to, have to take on education or all the other pieces that you do for a resident. So because of that, this, the U.S. Civil Rights Trail and the Tennessee Civil Rights Trail makes sense for us to be very involved in, bring people, let them spend money, that helps those economies locally and statewide, but it's the humanitarian missional benefits that I think inspires our group because we get to bring people to Tennessee for lots of things. We've got amazing music and outdoors and culinary and, and history and just, I mean, as a brand marketer all my life, Tennessee, take away our sand because we don't have sand for beaches but, and maybe <laughs> casinos. But, you take away those two things, and Tennessee has more for a visitor experience than anything. But what better to drive people to do is to come and be a part of the Civil Rights Trail and to learn. Um, my wife loves the quote uh, from my, uh, Maya Angelou that says, uh, you know, do the best you can do until you know better, and then when you know better, do better. And this trail and these podcasts, I think, have the additional benefit, hopefully, for visitors when they come. That's great. All right, we have a call here. Who's on line one? 
who is it? Ashley. Um, hello, Ashley. Yes. Go right ahead. I've got a question for Mr. Robinson. Um, did you have the experience of working with John Sigenthaler? My experience around that Mr. Ziegenthaler was he was very proactive in the civil rights movement. Uh, he, I, I believe he started something at Vanderbilt University, the, the Freedom Forum, or something of that nature. If you could speak on it, I'm going to hang up now and just listen to what you have to say. I Thank am, you. I Thank am, you. Uh, I have not had, I never did have the opportunity to meet uh, Mr. Siegenthaler. But I have seen some of the, the footage of him talking about his involvement, uh, particularly in Montgomery and, uh, and, and also uh, here when, with our school desegregation situation. Um, very, very, very wonderful man. I wish I would have had the chance to meet him, but I, unfortunately I did not get that. Started job. the First Amendment Center at Vanderbilt. He was also obviously major with the Tennessee and the publisher of the Tennessee, and mm -hmm. you, you probably know him. Um, so, yeah. Um, thank you, Ashley. Let's go to Wilma. Who is on the line? Hello, Wilma. Hey, y'all. Uh, Mr. Uh, let's see, Mr. Elliot, is that it? Yes. Elliot Robertson, Mr. Robinson? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, you know, there's something that I found out here in the past year on Open Line, and it was when Diane Nash asked Mayor uh, West if he thought that, you know, segregation was right and whatnot. I found out that she had to ask him three times before he responded. I'm a native Nashvilleian, and I never knew that. But uh, Mr. Robinson, uh, I was in the Nashville room just a few weeks ago, and I ran into you, matter of fact. But uh, one of the first things that I went down there after the Nashville room opened, I did, is I went and talked to Mary May. And I asked Miss May where the crystal on Church Street was, and she walked me into the end room down there, the Civil Rights Room, and pointed up at a picture of the crystal. Yes. And from what I understand, the crystal was one of the first restaurants that uh, Representative Lewis tried to integrate and that is exactly the restaurant where my parents met and I used to I started going in there I found out I got some maps to find out exactly where the location of that crystal was and I would sit there and and, and do research and, and write and stuff like that because that's where my parents met wow. but there's oh, so many great. little stories like that around Fifth Avenue and everybody concentrates on the Woolworth but I want to say this we had a Pulitzer Prize award-winning journalist in this town that worked for the Tennessean. And if we had not had such good journalists back in the day, hmm. a lot of these stories would not have been told. So we, ha I have a great, uh, you know, a, a big deal of gratitude towards journalists for that and for being a national and being a part of that. So thank well, you well, for well, listening. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. So. There's a lot there, and I'm gonna I'm gonna direct that to you. Take whatever you want. I'm fascinated by the the crystal. But what what what, what do you take away from from that? Uh, there there is a picture in our room. Uh, there there was the crystal, the TikTok, and a place called Candyland, which was on the corner of Seventh and Church. And you can see uh, those the picture of these places up up in, in our space. And then there's a protest going on in in the photo. So it's it's really a, a it's really hallowed ground uh, mm -hmm. to be situated right in the center of where all of this was going on, um, and now to have Fifth Avenue be renamed as John Lewis Way is a very powerful full circle moment for the city, and uh, and, and we're very proud to be able to to talk about these things and share these stories with folks. We're going to share some more stories. We're going to take a break. Come back, share some more stories. I want to I want to ask you about Diane Nash, you um, Commissioner about um, Clinton. So we'll take a break. Come back, share some more stories. We're back right after this.